Today's symposium will take a first-hand look at how we can divide complex workforce development topics into three parts, business, education, and workforce. I want to ensure Southwest Florida businesses and education partners that I am looking forward to hearing about tomorrow's workforce outcomes. One of the things that every economic development office worries about across the country is, are we training our workforce for the jobs of yesterday or are we training them for the jobs of tomorrow? Some of the soft skills that, that we've been looking for, uh, time management and communication skills. And the companies that we work with, the number one skill set that they are reporting software development skill sets. Um, so when you start to get into app development or major backend product development. Had to reach outside the area for uh, specialized uh, positions such as uh, process engineering and uh, information technology specialists. And for our frontline manufacturing employees, really finding those individuals that have the aptitude to be able to uh, grow and develop in a manufacturing role. Skill gaps and shortages, construction trades period. The baby boomers starting to age out of the workforce. There's not a lot of pipeline for employees coming up through high school or trade schools. Basic communication skills uh, through email, responding to professional emails or writing professional emails in a way that's not a text message. A work ethic. As a manager or supervisor, one of the things that I don't like to do is spend a lot of time micromanaging employees. And it really just goes back to, you know, be on time, doing the job that you paid for, and then being responsible. What we're really struggling with now is finding qualified and skilled drivers. We struggle a little bit with the night crew show up to work. It's a night owl type job. Working in healthcare really requires heightened levels of empathy, which you can imagine. Uh, but we're finding that we have team members who are struggling to really understand the importance of having that extra time to connect with patients while meeting their time management demands of technically and uh, physically caring for the patient. Are there other third party educator or facilities that you work or vendors you use to train your workforce or do you do your training in-house? We do a lot of our training in-house. The program is, is we train our drivers in our shuttle yards or in our facility yards. Most of our drivers that come on board, we do require a couple years of experience. You know, can you go a little bit more detail about what AirGlaze is going to be and what you think your specific job types will be? going to be a cargo um, commercial airport. It will be the first privatized airport in the U.S. Doing is focusing on perishable goods and making um, today's model more efficient. So um, adding shelf life is very um, critical in what we're doing and it's become actually an objective um, to add um, these goods on the shelves for market consumers like ourselves at creating about 1,700 um, direct jobs on airport. In turn, that's about one and a half to two jobs of off-airport or indirect jobs, trade and logistics, aviation, um, aerospace, also manufacturing distribution. Are there other sectors that you partner with? With, with you guys, I'm doing some internal training, some management training. We're finding what we're hiring is a much younger workforce and a lot of them don't have the management experience. So you guys have helped with a lot of our, our classes and kind of cultivating some of those skills needed to lead in this next generation. Does Southwest Florida have the IT infrastructure that we really need? Southwest Florida physically has the infrastructure, technology focused individuals that are looking to relocate out of areas like the Bay Area or New York, densely physical components definitely have the space we have the housing you know we're developing more of that in some additional attractions into the region uh, that would attract a younger demographic be other skill sets you think that will have to be acquired to to prepare in the future it's unbelievable how quickly the technology is changing the shape of healthcare. you know you look at some of the simple ones like artificial intelligence that can immediately help determine the course of care available for review, such as the intelligence with Watson. It's real and it's working. You know, it will immediately advise the providers with algorithms based on uh, information from medical records, treatment plans that it can mine very, very quickly from across the globe. When you think about it from a healthcare perspective, you know, we've had robotic surgery for a long time, which, you know, is not new and allows precision for the provider and, and better outcomes really for the patients. 
we here at NCH have had in three or four robots that roam the floors on the first floor and get in the elevator, go up to the units, and they deliver our supplies. So this is where we once used runners. So now we need people to help us, you know, with the technology for the robots to ensure that they can get where they need to get to. It's affected our environmental services staff, NCH, is that we're very fortunate to have our Xenex germ zapping robots, and those are used to sterilize our rooms. Each robot can completely disinfect all of the surfaces in a room in about 10 minutes. We're almost uh, finished with renovations that will soon be uh, completed for a state-of-the-art simulation center at our downtown campus. To be trained in procedural skills, this is going to take a skill set and sources to provide this training. Telehealth, we, uh, it's really emerging more since the pandemic, and it does affect the level of workforce needed in the physician practices, for instance. If patients are not presenting to be seen, it gives the provider flexibility to work remotely from anywhere. What does the workforce of manufacturing look like in the future? And does AI and robotics play a, a role? Our productivity is bringing in automation into the manufacturing environment. Automation really looks like far more sophisticated equipment that we use to manufacture the products. And with that sophistication comes different skill sets that are necessary. What we're finding is that new entrants into the workforce require a very different style of training. So that's been an interesting challenge for us from a, a training standpoint, finding training programs that work for all employees and their different backgrounds and, and technical experiences. The increase in sophistication of the equipment also means that that equipment is generating tremendous amount more data. We have this mixture of needing individuals that still have the strong uh, manual and mechanical skills that are necessary to do manufacturing and yet also have to be able to handle the sophistication of more complex equipment and be able to handle the, the data that comes out of that environment. One of our issues that we have in Collier County is simply the cost of living. The cost of the land down here drives the housing costs up. You know, trying to uh, recruit from a manufacturing standpoint for our frontline uh, operators, that annual challenge that we really haven't found a solid solution for. I recently heard that the students in Collier County Public Schools that 65% of the student base in Collier County have at least one family member at home that, that English is their second language. So we have this communication barrier, really making sure that individuals that come on board into uh, our frontline positions have the language skills that they need to have in order to uh, be successful and, and for us to be able to grow and, and invest in them and, and find opportunities for them in the future. That's been an interesting challenge. speaking. Is that a challenge for uh, BNI as well? Yes. Spanish speaking population in our company is about 49% of our entire employee population. And so there are language barriers. Do offer English as a second language in all three regions. Partnered with many post-secondary education facilities to provide that education. And we also offer the uh, Rosetta Stone for that, and we offer it through our online learning management system. So we're trying to bridge that gap, but the fact remains, and especially in Southeast and Southwest Florida operating regions, those populations are largely Spanish speaking. And the skills that comes from those people who are coming from other countries, from they're coming to Southwest Florida because there are job opportunities. Construction is not going away. You see that everywhere you look in the area. We do a lot of work with hospitals and schools. We do reach out to those schools. We show the students what a career in construction can look like and uh, construction has its technology advances as well. Yes, you still have to turn a wrench and pound nails with a hammer, sling pipe and weld it together, but there are a lot of automated processes that we do here in our main facility. We do some preparation work and pre-construction of modules that would used to made up on the job site itself. We construct them here, prefab them, and then we send them off to the various job sites and the uh, workforce there just connects it up. It's all ready to go for them. Big problem that, that we see, lack of interest in construction. So we're doing everything we can with these schools to promote that. And unfortunately, there's just not enough schools that have the kind of resources that a lot of companies are looking for. And it's not just B&I. There are several other mechanical contractors in the region that suffer the same workforce shortage, yeah. sometimes tend to shift bodies back and forth between companies, depending on who has the most work at the time. Technology in and of itself has also played a part with some of the things we do with our CAD programs, building information management systems. 
We have technology now that can go into a facility and map a room a million points a minute where in the past people would have to actually go in and hand draw the piping racks and the duct work and the equipment locations. This technology will actually map it and put it into a workable engineering drawing. We work with some of the schools like Florida Southwest College has a very good CAD program. We brought several people over from that organization and FGCU for project engineers and project managers. They have a very good civil engineering course, but just because you're taking a civil Civil engineering class doesn't mean you want to do civil work. You may have propensity to do good things with piping and air conditioning duct work or electrical work. And we have uh, certainly transitioned uh, two or three of those students from civil engineering degrees into very strong mechanical engineering project managers. Your new building, everyone should see the, the new building rising along I-75 between Daniels and Lico. Are you designing that for our future workforce? We're building a, a very nice 60,000 square foot building right off of I-75, close to FGCU, which is one of the strategic things we're doing because uh, we do hire a lot of either second career or second job out, out of college. Things with facilities, I mean, we have a, a gym, a cafeteria, chefs and stuff, basketball court, uh, walking track. You know, it's a tough industry, uh, supply chain logistics, it's nonstop, it's, it's full of issues to offset some of that stress that comes with that. We've created a facility that's great for whenever you're working there, but also attract the talent, people that are eager to do good things, and it, it kind of promotes a, a culture and a feeling of positivity. Is it too early to start thinking about your career? It needs to start in elementary school, in elementary, and, and be able to be nourished and allow to be changed from time to time because people's interests and other things come up. From an aviation perspective, by communicating earlier on, um, in those school years because a lot of students don't know what they don't know so we're looking at you know jobs in aviation aviation maintenance um, as well as in manufacturing distribution so a lot of individuals don't understand what type of work um, those industries offer they're getting prepared for the workforce they kind of understand the opportunities that are available for them start early but be realistic about the positions i've been to a couple of places recently and the conversation was really with these young students on how much money they can make. I've had conversations with nurses that come in and say, oh my God, I never knew that I would have to do this stuff. It's not about the money. It's really, for me in nursing, it's about the empathy and the compassion and the willingness to care. So I think we need to set them up for success versus going through the training and then finding, wow, I may make a good wage, but this is I'm not cut out for this. What are some of the resources that are available for companies and individuals for training? Services that we can offer in terms of training for the business community, they vary, but they're really tailored towards the needs of that industry or that employer. We do classroom training, mainly conducted through the vendors that we have that have been approved by the board of directors that include the technical colleges and universities, etc. And what we do is we determine if an individual that's come to our center needs skills upgrade before they become a productive employee for one of our local businesses. Now the timing is difficult there because an individual may have to go to class for four, five, six months, maybe a year to get the skills that they need. So we have three or four other programs that are available for the business community. So I mentioned internships. We've been known to put some people as internships for up to 13 weeks. We have the on-the-job training, and I know that was mentioned, and that's a really a quick way to find somebody, recruit somebody, get them into the employer. We write contracts, and it's very simple. We don't have to have an attorney. It's three or four or five pages. What we do with on-the-job training is you agree to hire them. We do a skill gap analysis between the individual that we have in our system who's going to be working for you. So if you need them at level 10 and they're at level 5, we determine the number of hours of training that needs to be placed with your staff to bring them up to that level level and then we can determine the number of hours that will need to be done and then we can reimburse you parts of that individual salary so that we cover what the law calls extraordinary training costs but what it does it covers the downtime and loss of production of some of the supervisors. We have a work experience component which is really geared for youth but the youth go up through age 24 and in work experience we can put somebody with you station them there you have them you work them we actually pay their salary they're actually since they're on a work experience program under our system they're actually covered under the workers comp system through the state of florida so there's really no expense for you other than supervision and we hope that at the end of the work experience component you've taught them it was mentioned today soft skills foundation skills and then they become a productive employee for you so those are some of the few things but if you really have a question or an interested to figure out how we can help you please contact one of our offices and we'll make arrangements to get somebody from our centers to meet with you 
to provide it over the phone through Zoom, whatever's best for your organization and determine the best strategy we need to do that. There's been mention of soft skills. We build soft skills into all of our workshops. We actually refer to them as foundation skills. But with the pandemic, our, our workshops have been very limited, probably non-existent and what we have done have been virtual. But when they come back in, they will include those foundational skills that you all have talked about today. So with that, we'll, we'd like to close. I'd like to thank Dane Eagle. I'd like to thank our economic development directors. I'd like to thank the panelists, John Tomich, who did a great job for us, and Mike Jackson, the president of our board. Symposium says this is a Tomorrow's Workforce Trilogy. This is the first. Our second one is going to be held on March 25th at 8.30, and it's going to focus on education's roles in the preparation of tomorrow's workforce. We hope that everyone will join us, and I was glad to see that there were some questions from education asking how they could help. This will be a time to say this is the role we need to do. And then our third one's going to be on how do we make sure we accomplish the changes that need to be made, whatever that change has to happen. If it's a legislative change, if it's another change, that we work together as a group, as a team to accomplish those. So on behalf of Career Source Southwest Florida, myself, we thank all of you for participating today. We hope that you provide feedback to us as it was good, bad, whatever you think it was appropriate. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and a great weekend. Thank you.